Um, we're um, delighted to welcome Dr. Jane Rempel from the University of Sheffield. Uh, Dr. Rempel started her academic career in Canada um, and then also did her Master of Studies at Oxford and her PhD at Michigan. And uh, she's been at Sheffield now for 14 years, incredibly. Um, she has, is very heavily involved in the uh, Sheffield Classical Association, which is one of the oldest branches, and um, which is celebrating its centenary next year. And she's also the co director of the Medieval and Ancient Research Centre of the University of Sheffield, which is brilliantly entitled Marcus, which I, I think is really very clever. Uh, I have been trying to think of acronyms for things which, in myself, and believe me, it's a fine art. Um, and that, one, that, that one is a zinger.
two gyres, the western gyre and the eastern gyre, which allowed you to cut up or down along those currents across the Black Sea north-south, again, the shortest spot between roughly the area of Sinope and um, southern Crimea. So not only incredible harbors, um, and in fact, still one of the best or the best natural harbor on the Black Sea coast, big tanker ships still take shelter um, in this area here when a storm blows up on, on the Black Sea. Um, but so not only sort of a good position in relationship to the, the southern coast in general, but also in relationship to the rest of the Black Sea, a really prominent nodal spot uh, in the Black Sea for the site of ancient Sinope. And much earlier as well, we had evidence for uh, 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 human presence and occupation as early as the Calcolithic uh, in this region. Um, and, and also evidence from that period of things traveling from the north coast of the Black Sea to the south coast as well. This, this interaction and, and con connectivity of Sinope and the southern coast with the rest of the Black Sea is clear from those early periods. Through the Bronze Age and the early Iron Age, and then we have the foundation of Sinope uh, towards the end of the 7th century BC. If you've heard of Sinope before, and you might well have, I'd be interested if you have, where you go, in what context, um, it might well be, um, as part of Xenophon's analysis, his account of his march of his 10,000 men uh, back home uh, takes, him, takes him and his men up to the Black Sea coast at Trasson, where they saw the sea, Thalata, Thalata, uh, and then they sailed um, along the coast back to uh, Byzantium. And he describes sailing past Sinope, and interestingly, they made harbor about 10 kilometers to the west of Sinope, a place called Tarnay modern Achneman, uh, they didn't go to Sinope, which is interesting, but I might talk about that today. Um, you might also have heard of Sinope because at one point it became the capital of the Pontic Kingdom or the Mithridatic Kingdom. Uh, it became the capital um, in 183 BC, so the start of the second century BC, um, but it's probably most famous as the birthplace of Mithridates VI, Mithridates Eucator, Mithridates the Great, uh, who fought Pompey uh, and was ultimately defeated, uh, and uh, uh, Sinope became part of the, um, the Roman Empire in uh, 63 BC. You might also know of modern Sinop uh, in the context of things like the Crimean War. Again, it's important that Sinop as a, as a harbor of port on the south coast uh, was really important, um, and it was the site of the Battle of Sinop when the Russian Imperial Navy uh, destroyed the Ottoman fleet that was based in Sinope. Here we have a reconstruction or a, 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 an illustration um, of, of that battle. And it was this battle that drew the French and the English into the Crimean War. So this, this sort of sense of Sinop as, a, as an incredibly important nodal place on the south coast of the Black Sea, but also with clear connections to the rest of the Black Sea, um, and especially across to Crimea, uh, is something that continues in many different ways through time. But I want to talk to you about the period in which we have uh, an ancient Greek settlement founded uh, at, uh, at, at Sinope, um, dated from around 630 BC, that stated, that, um, dated from a combination of literary evidence, but particularly uh, pottery evidence that has been found uh, in excavation. Um, and uh, it, the settlement was, was founded on this, this narrow neck of After Sinope, a nymph, uh, who's probably most famous for um, tricking a series of gods who, who wanted to, to be with her uh, and, and getting them to offer her her greatest desire, to which she said virginity, and then they had to you know, let go of their hopes for her. Um, and uh, my colleague, one of my colleagues, Owen Junin, has, has suggested that this might reflect a certain insularity. Uh, in, in Sinop's early attitude and, and uh, towards towards um, the uh, towards the inland hinterland population, so the foundation of Sinope sits within a broader phenomenon that we usually call ancient Greek colonization, uh, and this is something that started in the eighth century BC in the Mediterranean. All the red flags are, are uh, important uh, ancient Greek settlements or colonies uh, founded throughout the Mediterranean region. Um, in the Black Sea, this uh, this phenomenon started a bit later, started around 630 BC, the last third of the 7th century BC. Sinope was one of the earliest of uh, these settlements, these Greek settlements founded in the Black Sea region. And it's often referred to as Ionian colonization because.
as our ancient sources tell us that uh, that uh, Ionian Greeks from the west coast of Turkey, and specifically Milesian Greeks, Greeks from, from the, uh, the, the, the polis of Miletus, were, were, were the sort of founders of many of these settlements. Um, and there are many tens of settlements in the Black Sea that are connected with Miletus particularly as its founding, uh, as its founding city, including Sinope. Um, compared to especially the north coast of the Black Sea, but also the west coast of the Black Sea, where there's been many, many decades of a lot of archaeological research done uh, uh, around the Greek uh, settlements and their hinterlands and, and even uh, more broadly, the, the south coast of the Black Sea is much less known archaeologically. Uh, and and in, in various ways, Sinop sits apart from, from that as a place where we're, we're starting to be able to, to sort of say, talk about a picture that is comparable or one that we can start asking questions and comparing it to what we know from the north and the west coast of the, the Black Sea. And one of the reasons we have um, relatively more data from, from Sinope and other parts of uh, the southern coast of the Black Sea uh, is due to the Sinope Regional Archaeological Project, which was run by uh, Alex Bauer and Owen Dunan, um, two of my colleagues from the States. And they, over 10 seasons, mm -hmm. conducted uh, extensive and intensive field surveys, so walking systematically over fields and, and collecting pottery shares and other evidence of human activity in order to trace and map the way that, that people moved and lived in the landscape through, through time. Um, and in relation to the, our period, ancient Sinope, um, they found something really quite interesting. In, in stark contrast to most of the other settlements around the Black Sea, at least where we have evidence, um, the early stages of ancient Sinope seem to be focused directly out to sea. There's no evidence of the development of contact or settlement in the hinterland of Sinope for at least 200, 250 <coughs> years. It's not until the fourth century BC that we see this um, engagement of the settlement of Sinope with the, that fertile hinterland. So these early stages of Sinope seem to be really focused on the sea, hence the idea that potentially this idea of Sinope being standoffish, isolated, keeping herself away from people is something that perhaps might be a spin-off mentality, but um, we won't go too much into that. So, brings us to the Sinop Palais Excavations Project, where we had three seasons of excavation between uh, 2015 and 2017, uh, which was a project designed explicitly to, uh, to add a, an excavation element to this broader survey project in order to, to, um, to find out more about the actual urban settlement of Sinope, uh, but also to uh, develop a stratified uh, series and sequence of, of ceramics, especially local ceramic typology, with which we could then use to better interpret the survey data. So this is a really rich opportunity to have excavated and survey data that we can ha have to speak to each other, and is again something that would be analogous to what we have on the north coast of, of the Black Sea, where there's, where there's quite a few examples of those types of data sets. So the Sinop Palais Excavations Project was started by my colleague Owen Dunin, who, who was head of the, the survey project, um, and, but it's a, it's a large collaborative project, including uh, Owen, Alex, and other colleagues from America, uh, my colleague Dr. Ebony Sokman from Hittite University in Chorum uh, in Turkey, as well as the Sinop Museum. So a large collaborative project working in the actual town of the Sinop itself. Um, and uh, uh, where there's been a lot of uh, rescue excavations or, or commercially oriented excavations, uh, but, but little sort of, um, sort of research-driven, systematic, uh, stratified excavation. Um, here we can see this next of the Bazatepe Peninsula. This yellow area represents the, 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 the site of the, the earliest Greek um, settlement. We have the most important uh, harbor here on the south coast of the peninsula, and our excavations are located just in this uh, um, part of the, the, the settlement. Sinop Palais, it actually refers to the uh, fortifications of, of uh, this part of Sinop. Here you can see um, uh, an illustration of these fortifications when they are standing a bit more, and here a picture of some of the best preserved parts of it. Most of this fortification is um, it's Belgic and Ottoman, it's much later, um, but the western wall of the Calais is actually a Hellenistic fortification wall, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on uh, to, for, the rest of, uh, for the rest of tonight. 
Um, so here we have a plan of the later fortifications of Sinop. Here is the, the Calais area and then the broader uh, city uh, walls and the modern street plan of Sinop. And, and what, I've, what I've annotated here are the bits of evidence prior to our excavations that we had for the very earliest stages of, of Greek settlement at Sinope. And they included some of the earliest street pottery or the earliest street pottery evidence from Sinop that were done um, in tucked trenches in this, what's uh, called here the Acropolis area. It is indeed the highest point of land on this neck. Um, that were dug in the 50s that um, had been unpublished and lost, potentially. Um, and, and a uh, necropolis, the cemetery area, that was also, also excavated um, in, that, in that period that had burials from the 6th century BC and later. Um, and then we have what um, has been interpreted as evidence of a, of a, of a grid plan, an early uh, sort of uh, gridded plan to the um, to the urban part of the settlement, which almost certainly uh, dates to, or at least has its origins in, in the classical period, um, and uh, evidence from uh, a sanctuary area here of 6th, 5th, 4th century construction, um, really recent evidence for uh, harbor construction that at least dates to the Hellenistic period here on the north side, and this Hellenistic wall here running um, at, at the time that it was built, uh, just as a curtain wall, a single curtain wall cutting off the neck of the peninsula and descending the uh, Sinope settlement from landward approach because what we have here are incredibly steep cliffs, um, other than the harbor, incredibly steep cliffs all the way around the Bagatelle Peninsula. Land was really the important sort of place to, uh, to protect. Oh, and our excavation area uh, was located just um, on the edge of what would have been the Acropolis just outside this Hellenistic fortification wall, which you can see here. This is the Hellenistic uh, wall itself. Um, the tower um, is, was originally Hellenistic, and these uh, lower parts of this wall are Hellenistic. This is the later uh, Seljuk Ottoman wall, and we have later constructions and reconstructions of these walls, including modern restorations here. But for this curtain wall that ran along here, we have the original Hellenistic Wall. And indeed, Strabo described Sinope as the beautifully walled city. He was almost certainly referring to this wall that we see here. It's a huge wall that runs almost 300 meters across the, the most narrow part of the, the neck of the peninsula. Um, it has six to eight towers um, punctuating the wall along, uh, along the way, depending on how you reconstruct it. And some of the tallest surviving parts of this wall are up to 15 meters this is the largest standing fortification from uh, the, the ancient Greek period in this region. It's a really sort of, it's, it's, it's a real definite monument um, in this area. Um, and yet, all that we could say about it was that it was a Hellenistic wall. Uh, and and what, what more could we say about it? It was one of the, one of the sort of questions that uh, decided um, some of our, our, our research strategy. So this is um, a plan of our excavation area. We had our main trenches in this area, and I'll, I'll give you a brief overview of those in a minute. Um, but we also had a, an excavation trench um, up against the wall, and we were able to excavate uh, the foundation trench of the wall, which has proved to be incredibly informative. We're also interested in what was below that, uh, but uh, that's a story for uh, another day. Uh, here you can just see, this is the, uh, the wall itself. The second tower um, along, um, uh, running uh, to the south along its circuit, just surviving in foundation, and this is the trench up against the, uh, the wall itself. Our main trench was also, our set of trenches was also dominated by walls, uh, not least the foundation of a, of a, of a Byzantine, a later Byzantine uh, curtain wall that was constructed um, almost certainly primarily for its visual effect rather than its defensive effect uh, along the entire course of this Hellenistic curtain wall, um, probably emulating the fences of Constantinople at the time, and this is something that um, uh, is, a, is a feature of early Byzantine uh, wall. So, uh, but other than that, and, and, and below the, the Hellenistic fortification wall, we have a series of earlier walls, which um, are probably a combination of terrace walls and early fortification walls or, or compound-defining walls, as well as evidence for early domestic occupation.
structures um, that uh, uh, certainly run into a period where there is Greek presence in the site, or at least significant contact with the Greek world, but potentially predate that period as well. So this, this part of our site is clearly a, a liminal zone of the ancient Greek or the ancient Greek settlement and, and, and whatever uh, was there before, which might have been a seasonable, seasonal fishing encampment or, or, or something like that. Um, but it's a Thomistic fortification wall that I want to, uh, to, to, to consider more fully. Here you can see the location of our trench and what remains of the circuit or the, the length of that Hellenistic fortification wall, which has been cut through and added to in various ways, but um, is very clearly um, Hellenistic in origin, but what does that mean? The Hellenistic period, as you, said, as you probably know, um, traditionally dates from the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BC through to the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. None of those dates, or neither of those dates, make much sense for the Black Sea, um, but so roughly later, 4th century through to uh, the, the, the end of the 1st century uh, BC for, for, for this area. Uh, and we can say quite confidently that the first phase of this wall was definitely Hellenistic based on architectural typology. The type of masonry with cut blocks um, with reserved margins, <laughs> reserved edges, and rusticated faces put together without, um, without uh, mortar, uh, with iron clamps, um, the use of towers with beveled corners, all of these things are very clearly uh, you know, identifiers of a Hellenistic fortification wall uh, from the ancient Greek world. But when in the Hellenistic period? You know, what more can we say? And architecturally, there's, there's nothing more we can say about this wall. And I think perhaps for that region, reason, it hasn't really been studied very much. It's this huge monument, it's there, it's dominated, but it hasn't really been studied much, certainly not its, its earliest, uh, earliest phase. And in fact, it's usually just been assumed to be associated with the Pontic kings, the, the, the kings of the Pontic a uh, kingdom who made Sinope their capital, specifically Phronites I, who, who, who conquered Sinope and made it a capital in 183 BC, so the early second century, or Mithridates the sixth, who was born in Sinope, the last great ruler of the Pontic Kingdom, so that would have made it some, somewhere around the early first century BC. But there's never been any way to sort of test this uh, assumption until we dug uh, the foundation trench as part of um, our excavation project. Um, here in, um, in, in this trench, you can see the foundation trench outlined uh, very poorly, I'm sorry, in red. Um, and it here has been truncated by this later pitch, Locus 101, but we know from other sections that were excavated it would have um, extended out to a distance of about two and a half meters from the wall um, at this sort of angle. And I have to tell you, I didn't think it was going to be very interesting to excavate a foundation trench of a fortification wall, but lo and behold, it was actually fascinating because we were able to get a really clear sense of how this wall was constructed, and also the fact that it seemed to be constructed really quite quickly. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, or quickly, in a relatively short period of time, and we'll, we'll, I'll explain what I mean by that uh, in, in a minute. One of the things that became very evident was the, the, the sort of process of digging out the trench and then filling it back in in, in what seemed to be relatively uh, quick succession. So they dug in this section, they dug a really quite deep section of the trench, but then filled it in with this quite homogenous red sandy clay uh, level that's quite deep. And I think that was once they dug the trenches and they figured out what level the wall needed to be constructed on, they realized that they dug it too deep here and filled it back in. And then they had two different leveling courses. The, this one here, this letter C is just the same with very fine beach sand creating an incredible leveling course on which to lay um, the foundation blocks uh, on it, and D is the lowest coast of the foundation blocks. Um, and then, once they were constructing the wall itself, laying the, there's two courses of foundation and then the proper wall uh, starts above that, the trench was filled in as they laid the blocks, um, and filled in almost certainly with smallish bucket loads of material, really loose, not compacted at all, must have been filled in within a matter of days or two. Um, there's so much wind blowing sand at this site that, which we didn't find in this fill. It was almost certainly being filled in really quickly as the as the blocks were being laid and being put up. And then we could even see that they left, um, as they laid a course of blocks, they left an area reserved for the le final leveling of that course once it was in place in situ. They would, you can see, oh, it's hard here, it's gone off the screen. This is a, a block, and here was a sort of empty pocket with which the, the 
leveling chip, the, the final cleaning or, or, or dressing of those blocks was sort of swept into this place, and then they put the next block on and do the, the same thing again. So we have this sort of relatively intimate picture of, of the construction of wall, which includes piles of mushroom shells, which we are keeping for their lunch, uh, and that, that kind of thing. We also got a sense of what was here before uh, the wall, including some indication that um, there was uh, necropolis activity in, in, in the close vicinity, um, including pieces of funerary sculpture and even a few fragments of, of human bones. But I want to come back to the chronology of this wall because really that was the, the richest picture that our, our excavations could uh, contribute to. So as I said, the traditional uh, chronology of this wall, the traditional dating of this wall was based on the historical figures of Barnacles the first, that, that first Pontic king who, who made Sinop the capital uh, in 183 BC, um, or Mithridates the sixth of Pontus, uh, of Pontus um, who was associated with those beautiful walls that Strabo, um, Strabo uh, describes. We do have a textual reference for a set of fortifications at Sinope from the early fourth century BC, in conjunction with the siege by the Persian satrap Datames. Um, but this wall is definitely later than that. It can't be. It can't be that wall, and we have no evidence of a, of a wall from that period. So, um, what does the material from our foundation trench tell us? Well, you're not going to be seeing beautiful images of vases and large pieces of pottery because foundation trench material in general tends to be small, bitty pieces, really quite abraded, and also representing quite a long period of time. There's almost certainly digging their foundation trench into much earlier layers of activity, and that still gets spilled back into the trench. So what I want to show you now are the latest datable pieces of pottery from this foundation trench. I'm not going to talk about the earlier material that came from it, but this is the latest datable material, which all comes from the fourth or first half of the third century BC, and takes the form of, of black slipware in various ways, or black glossware, um, depending on what vocabulary using. Um, here you can see some of the very bitty little pieces uh, that we were dealing with, many of which weren't particularly diagnostic, but it was very clear that some of this black slip was coming from, from Athens, based on the fabric and the quality of, of the slip, uh, but also coming from many other production centers. Some of them certainly Black Sea, some of them also probably uh, Ionian, Ionian uh, Greek uh, as well. Um, this is very typical of the 4th and 3rd centuries BC in the Black Sea, so nothing uh, out of the ordinary there. We do have some features from these little bits that are actually quite diagnostic, quite, uh, quite useful in terms of chronology, including evidence for stamped decoration on these pots and rouletted decoration, where, where um, uh, a, rouletting wheel will be, or a rouletting tool will be held down on the wheel and create a circle of um, uh, incised impressed uh, decoration, um, all of which give us a sort of later 4th century uh, in general date. We do have some pieces which have survived in large enough form to give us the opportunity to, to create clear comparanda from well-published uh, and, and dated um, examples of black slipware, especially the Athenian agora uh, material, uh, which <coughs> provides some very close comparanda uh, for us. Here you can see a bit more of that letting decoration and here and the, the handle of a cup camphora. Um, the comparanda in terms of shape and in terms of the, the letting decoration itself suggests it's no later than the end of the fourth century uh, BC. We do have some things that date into the third century BC, including the, 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 the fish plate uh, shape, which is a, a flat plate-like shape, usually with a reserved area uh, in the middle. Um, and the closest comparanda for this comes from the north coast of the Black Sea, a site called Ovia. Um, and here you can see two of those uh, examples, uh, and this is an agora example as well. Um, the latest comparanda comes from the first quarter of the third century BC. In general, our corpus of black slip wares is very, very usual for the, the later fourth, third century, first half of the third century BC in the Black Sea, in terms of the range of, 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 of production centers that are represented, the types of shapes, and the later material having um, perhaps less precisely applied slips, uh, slightly heavier bases, very much comfortably putting us 
no later than, than the third century BC for sure. Um, a little bit more uh, precision, and certainly our latest datable shirt uh, is actually this little one, which may not look like much to you, but it's actually, um, and, and unfortunately it got washed a bit more vigorously than I would have liked, so that's why I'm showing you the fresh out of the ground uh, photo here, uh, and another one here, because it's very characteristic, both in shape and in decoration, with this overpainted yellow or buff um, design and these sort of uh, raised uh, dots of, of decoration, uh, making it very comfortably part of the, what's known as the West Slope uh, tradition of, of pottery, which is originally associated with Athens, um, but actually then gets produced in various places, especially Pergamon on the uh, on the uh, west coast of Turkey, and at least one or two Black Sea production centers as well. Um, again, um, here you can see uh, that our, our, our shirt sits as a, as a sort of very fine lip of a, of a, of a, of a, of a capris cup. Um, the example is from Olbia on the north coast of Black Sea that have the similar type garland decoration, um, date from the uh, first half of the third century BC. And in fact, in the Black Sea region, the majority of West Slope wear comes from the first half of the third century BC. There are, it still continues in much reduced uh, numbers into the later third century, uh, but uh, there's very, very little uh, after that. And based on the Comparanda and overall trends, it seems that this, this shirt, although it is our latest stable one, uh, probably is not later than the mid third century, um, although there's some room to think that perhaps it goes into uh, the later third century, but I'll explain to you why I think it's probably mid. Uh, in a, uh, a minute. All of this to say that the dateable pottery that we have from the Foundation Trench does not date later than um, the mid-3rd century BC, certainly not later than the end of the 3rd century BC, which makes it difficult to connect it to these Pontic kings who didn't arrive in Sinop, didn't conquer Sinop, until the 2nd century BC. But in case you're not convinced by what I've shown you, which admittedly is bitty, um, it's really notable what we don't have from the Foundation Trench. And those are key diagnostic fine wares that date to the later 3rd and 2nd centuries BC that we should have found if it indeed was built by one of these Pontic kings. Um, so that includes red slip wares, which, which sort of take over from uh, black slip tradition in the Black Sea, um, or even bichrome wares that kind of potentially represent a, a transitional um, period. Um, we also don't have any of the, the very diagnostic, both in shape and treatment, uh, Hellenistic color-coded anywhere, uh, which was produced probably in groves, uh, but circulated around the Black Sea in, in great quantity from the later 3rd century and especially the 2nd century BC. We don't have any mold-made bowls, which are also very characteristic of the 2nd century BC and also e easy to identify. We, we wouldn't have missed any shirts of this. And um, perhaps less unusual, but also notable because of its relative sort of ability to identify is that we don't have any Campana anywhere, which actually comes from, from Sicily, but was circulating in the Black Sea region in the second century BC. So we don't have, not only do we not have anything that could be dated later than the third century BC, we don't have any of the material that should come from the second or first century BC. Um, <coughs> which suggests that we should be looking at a different date for, for the construction of this wall. Um, and shifting up and looking for a date in the 3rd century uh, BC. Uh, and probably um, th we should be thinking about not control by the Pontic kings, but threat from the earlier Pontic kings as being a driving factor for constructing this wall. We know from textual sources that an earlier Pontic king, Mithridates III, um, attacked Sinope uh, around 220 BCE. And there's details of that story, including the fact that the island of Rhodes sent ballista. Uh, materials as, as, as support in this, in, to support Sinope in this battle, suggests that they had a wall with which to make the best use of their, uh, of their ballista. I think that we should be thinking about the wall as something that's constructed more, more here in the middle of the third century BC, which is only a matter of about a hundred years in date, but actually is a quite important conceptual shift about the meaning of this wall, because instead of thinking about it as a reflection of Sinope as a conquered city or a city that's part of a larger kingdom, it's a wall that was constructed by uh, at least a nominally independent Sinop as a statement about its defense and its position um, in this area. And we can also think about it then in conjunction with what's happening.
happening in the rest of the Black Sea, the way in which Sinop was connected to the rest of this Black Sea, uh, this region, if indeed this wall dates to uh, the middle of the third century rather than uh, the second or first century BC, because the late fourth and early third, the first half of the third century BC was a huge boom of fortification wall building in the Black Sea region. Um, the, red, uh, the sites marked out in red represent places where new walls were built in this period, and the blue represent where there was significant rebuilding or reconstruction um, or construction of new bits of existing fortification walls. Uh, and you can see that you know, there's, there's, there's quite a concentration of this going on in the Black Sea. And as much as fortification walls are defensive, they are also about display and statement of, 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 of you know, sort of power and control. Uh, and I think we can also be thinking about the implications here. Because this period, the late classical, early Hellenistic period in the Black Sea, was one that was marked by prosperity, mobility, and elite competition. And these walls fit very well within that paradigm. And at Sinop, we can see this mobility in terms of diplomatic uh, and, and political relationships all across the Black Sea, as well as people moving to Athens, like Leone, uh, Leon of Sinope, who, who died in Athens in the, the earlier 4th century BC. Um, we can see Sinope and Amphrae, wine and oil probably uh, both, and, and roof tiles and coins circulating really widely all around the Black Sea in this period, uh, so lots of prosperity, and also monumental tomb traditions, uh, like this sculpture that came from a, a pedimental funerary sculpture from the 4th century BC in Sinope. They're clearly participating in this Black Sea network, this 4th century, early 3rd century Black Sea that's very prosperous and, and dynamic and connected. So I think we should understand the walls as part of that tradition. Conveniently here we have a, a, a statue of Diogenes, uh, and this is framing the entrance to, to the town of, of Sinope. Diogenes is another example of this mobility and connection uh, in, in between Sinope and the rest of the uh, uh, Black Sea and Mediterranean world um, in the 3rd century BC, who is a philosopher that's most famous for, for being in Athens and, and telling Alexander the, the Great not to block his, his son, to, get, to stop uh, standing over him and casting shade uh, on, on, uh, on, uh, on him. So, um, excavation of foundation trenches can bring much larger discussions uh, about, about meanings of, of, of walls. We still have a bit of work to do to study um, the plain words in the question, and uh, hopefully my colleagues will be doing that this summer. And we also will be working more with the spatial data uh, and visualization data that we've uh, collected over the past three years, including some uh, 3D modeling that was done by photogrammetry of um, parts of the wall. So I will leave it there, and thank you very much for your attention. Absolutely wonderful, exciting lecture. Um, is this sounding? Yeah. Are you planning to do any more excavation? Perhaps where there might be more. You said there was an early Iron Age house, or in that? Yes. Uh, so, yes. Chronology. The, the, the sort of stratigraphy of that, of that the, the, the sort of floor level of the house are, are quite difficult. Um, being in this sort of liminal zone, it means that there's lots of cutting and cross cutting and eroding of, of, of stratigraphy. So uh, we have some snippets. Um, this phase of the project is, 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 is finished. Um, there's potential for excavation on, on the other side of that curtain wall, in that area that was sort of named Acropolis on, on the plan, but um, we'll see.
Uh, you, you found nothing uh, to indicate uh, Persian pres uh, presence. I mean, you, you mentioned the, the, the Temi siege, and then the, later on there's the coins of, uh, with, uh, with um, Aramaic uh, inscriptions of uh, yeah. n names, that kind of thing. Um, yes, so not in our excavations. Um, there are um, discussions of two groups of silver metalware that were sold in the 20th century um, that are connected with, with, I mean, they're definitely Persian-style material. Uh, so, so we know there's Persian, there's Persian presence, perhaps even Persian political control of, of Sinope. It's, it's difficult to establish exactly what that meant, though. Aside from the siege of Datum, which I'll, I'll, I'll come back to uh, in a minute, and the coins that have the, 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 his name uh, instead of the Sinope legend, um, there's quite a lot of debate about what, what Persian control of Sinope might have looked like. Um, everything from just you know a, a regular part of a regular uh, Persian satrapy to a, 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 a sort of relationship of, of, of kind of benign uh, distance in the sense that as long as as long as cities like Sinope or Heraclea Pontica or Amisos on that, that Black Sea coast paid their ultimate tribute to the king, then they could do whatever they want and weren't necessarily under the control of the, 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 the governor or the satrap um, of the province. Datumes is the obvious example here, where we, we have him coming to besiege Sinope, probably controlling Sinope for at least a short period of time. But then most people argue for another period of independence in the 4th century BC. Um, Tacitus talks about Paphlagonian, who was a ruler of Sinope at the end of the 4th century BC, but hard to know what to do with that reference. We certainly have evidence from Paphlagonians, who are the people who lived in the Pontus Mountains, just to the south of Sinope, living in Sinope as, as well, so grave, grave stealing with Paphlagonian names. Um, I can't give you a definitive answer, um, because uh, there's lots of arguments, and there's not enough evidence to, to sort of really support one, one version of this, but we didn't find anything that you would associate with, with Persian So many possible questions. Um, just I'm interested in the, the kind of uh, trading and shipping. Are, are there known kind of ancient wrecks around the area? Anything that tells us about what's going on? I think it's an interesting. Um, mm, let's see how far I need to go back. Um, I have to get to my satellite image. Oh, well, that's right. That's what we'll do. Um, so I think it's an interesting body of water because it's incredibly deep in its, in its large body. I think it's over 200 meters deep. Um, and on the south coast, we get. Sorry. On the south coast, we get a really steep drop off. Like relatively quickly, it just gets very, very deep. And under uh, under the, the, the first um, sort of upper portion of the the, the, the sea, the, the steepest part is actually anoxic. It's, it's, it's dead. It's toxic. There's no 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 oxygen in there. And this has to do with the amount of fresh water flowing in from the major rivers to the to the north and its relationship with the uh, with the Aegean. But there are um, some shallower shelves, uh, especially up here and along the Bulgarian coast. And the wrecks that have been found are, are mostly in this area. Um, and there are some uh, of the 5th, 4th century BC, which are really intriguing. There's not been a lot of large-scale kind of documentation um, and publication of those wrecks. Um, there's one where they've, they've done some analysis of the various amphorae that have come from it and, and that kind of thing. But we don't know as much about what's going on in terms of wrecks in the Black Sea as we might from, say, the Aegean or other parts of the Mediterranean. But there is a project, um, uh, an Anglo-Bulgarian Anglo project, that hopefully will be changing that picture soon. But it's not being directly around that area. No, um, <coughs> Bob Ballard, who found the Titanic, I don't know if you remember, he's an uh, underwater adventurer. Um, he was involved in one of the early stages of the, uh, the SRAP, the survey project, and he brought a special ship and um, robots to do survey um, along the coast of Sinop so they could have an, a, a sort of marine version of the on-land survey. Um, it was problematic for all sorts of reasons, and they only did one season, uh, but the results they got showed that, that there, were, there were what looked to be structures relatively low down, and this brings up questions about the flooding of the Black Sea and that kind of period. 
there's no proof for our period, uh, you know, my period, there's, there's, there's nothing, there's no, the sea level hasn't changed enough to make a difference because it drops so steeply. Um, there's no sort of unknown settlement. Whereas on, up here, there's a lot of underwater archaeology that's going on because there, the, the rise in sea level has actually meant that sediments have been submerged and things like that. Okay, so come, sorry, one, the follow-up question was about the topography, such oh, a distinctive okay. shape. <coughs> yeah. You know, so there, there is no kind of, Erosion or lost parts of sites in Oakley oh, okay. that we've been underwater. In terms of the itself. Yes. Um, no. Uh, sorry, we went the wrong way to get a picture of the, the peninsula. Um, I'm just trying to think. I mean, partly I'm, I'm struggling to answer because there's, there's just been relatively uh, little sort of excavation done, especially in sort of coastal difficult reach areas. But, but um, all along this coast, for sure, the, the drop-off is so, I mean, there's a cliff, so there hasn't been any significant um, erosion there. Here, um, around the, the sort of modern harbor and what was probably the, the main ancient harbor, the, the, the sort of rather than erosion, we've had reclaiming of land in, in significant ways. So that makes it really difficult to assess what might or might not have been lost. Um, further along the peninsula, this way, there are amphora factories that have been excavated and stuff. So, that, that, you know, we must not be missing too much because they were almost certainly coastal features. Um. Questions? Any other questions? No, okay. Well, um, I think in that case, what we'll do is we'll thank Jane once again for a really fascinating lecture. Um, with, I invite you all for a glass of wine and anything that's occurred to you while you're having a glass of wine, you can ask her while she's having a glass of wine, which she really deserves. <laughs> 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 <laughs>